Good morning and welcome to Talks at Google in Cambridge, Mass. Today it is my enormous pleasure to introduce Gregory McGuire. Gregory is the author of the beloved Wicked Years series, including Wicked, which is the basis for the mega long running, mega popular Broadway musical, which will be made into a mega popular movie someday after the musical stops running probably. Uh, he has published over 30 other novels and stories for children and young adults, including Confessions of an Ugly Stepsister, Lost, and Mirror, Mirror. He lives outside Boston with his partner, the outstanding painter Andy Newman. I recommend visiting his studio, as I have done, uh, which is um, at the Emerson Umbrella in Concord the next time I have open studios. Uh, beautiful work. And um, with their three children. Please join me in welcoming Gregory McGuire. I assume I'm, I'm wired in several directions, this one and, and this one, but if it starts to do feedback, you can all uh, plug your ears, but I won't see you because the lights are too bright, so it won't have too much effect. I met a, a, a distant friend in Cambridge in Harvard Square yesterday. By distant, I mean I'd met her once or twice before. She's a Tony-nominated musical actress, Carolee Carmelo, who's playing the part of Ms., uh, Mrs. Du Maurier in Finding Neverland at the ART. Uh, that's J.M. Barry's, the, the mother of J.M. Barry's uh, friend, Mrs. Llewellyn Davis. Uh, the reason I know her is because we both went to the university at Albany, and I met her at some sort of uh, festival of the arts celebrating the university's contribution to the arts about 10 years ago. And when I saw she was in town, I said to myself, well, I suppose I should be a good alum and call her up. And so we had a nice, a nice lunch. She said she was very proud to have an ID from Harvard because she was an actress at the ART for, since June. I said I never got that far. Indeed, when I first moved to the area in 1977, I lived just north of Harvard Square, but I was so timid about the radiant intellectualism generated by the furnace of those red bricks in that campus that for about two years, I didn't even know I was permitted to cross the campus. I, I always walked completely around the perimeter if I had to get to the other side. Uh, that's a kind of insecurity that I start with to suggest uh, two things, that I feel a little bit of that same insecurity today to walk into a building with Google on the, uh, on the letterpress of it, let's say. Uh, being a person who plays and thinks with very old-fashioned materials, namely folklore and children's stories, uh, anything, anything that smacks of cultural development beyond about 1875 makes me very nervous indeed. Nonetheless, here I am, and I'm thankful uh, to be welcomed here. I will make a, a, a slight correction to the introduction, which is that my books are not just for children and for YA. Indeed, Wicked and uh, eight other novels were published by the adult division of HarperCollins. Wicked is published as an adult book, and within the first four pages, there's a puppet uh, representing the local minister who has uh, two male appendages, one in the front and one in the back and a widow lady puppet and her daughter position themselves on both prongs and do a kind of a seesaw on him. I put that scene in really early so that grandmothers who were looking to see if this would be suitable for eight-year-old Hepzibah for Christmas would know right away that Hepzibah was going to love it. Um, <laughs> but it was um, definitely not a, not a book for children. But there's a kind of a puzzle right there because a great deal of my work starts with the one thing, perhaps, that everybody in this room and almost everybody that I ever talk to uh, has in common, despite our intellectual differences, despite our political differences, our racial uh, and ethnic and socioeconomic differences, and that is that we all originated in the culture of childhood. And we are all excommunicated from that land for the rest of our lives. But we all remember it, and we share that memory. And before we identified ourselves in other ways, we identified ourselves as children yearning toward some kind of story that helped to unriddle the world and make sense of us. 
Here's a little bit about the unriddling. I'm going to read three small things, but mostly I'm going to show slides today because I like to support my notion about the universality of our common origins in this room and in every room that I speak in by showing slides of my rather common origins, which were um, in upstate New York about uh, 50 years ago. But here's a section from Son of a Witch, which is uh, one of the books over here on the table. I think this is the one that's being given away for free. So if you don't take it and it's for free, I'm going to notice. <laughs> this is the beginning of the second section. And here is a, a sort of, I suppose, a little proof that this was not published for children. A notion of character not so much discredited as simply forgotten, once held that people only came into themselves partway through their lives. They woke up, were they lucky enough to have consciousness, in the act of doing something they already knew how to do, feeding themselves with currants, walking the dog, nodding up a broken boot lace, singing antiphonally in the choir, suddenly this is I. I am the girl singing this alto line off key. I am the boy loping after the dog. And I can see myself doing it as presumably the dog cannot see itself. How peculiar. I lift on my toes at the end of the dock to dive into the lake because I am hot. And while isolated like a specimen on the glassy slide of summer, the notions of hot and lake and I converge into a consciousness of consciousness. In an instant, in between launch and landing, even before I cannonball into the lake, shattering both my reflection and my old notion of myself. That was what was once believed. Now, it seems hardly to matter when and how we become ourselves or even what we become. Theory chases theory about how we are composed. The only constant, the abjuration of personal responsibility. We are the next thing the time dragon is dreaming, and nothing to be done about it. We are the fanciful sketch of Ryler Lean. We are droll and ornamental, and no more culpable than a sprig of, la of lavender or a or a sprig of lightning and nothing to be done about it. We are an experiment in situational ethics set by the unnamed God, which in keeping its identity secret also cloaks the scope of the experiment and our chance of success or failure at it. And nothing to be done about it. We are loping sequences of chemical conversions, acting ourselves converted. We are twists of genes acting ourselves twisted. We are wicks of burning neuroses acting ourselves wicked. And nothing to be done about it. And nothing to be done about it. So not much plot in that section. <laughs> but it does, in fact, bring us to the point. Where do we start from? And how is it that we have a common language? So now it comes to the common part. I was born in um, 1954 in Albany, New York. And, oh, I see. Now, I see myself, but I don't see the slides. I'm going to have to turn so I can see where I am. My father was a um, journalist, uh, a humorous writer. Oh, there they are. Thank you so much. And my, uh, my mother died in childbirth. So after... I was born, I was first taken by an aunt and then put in an orphanage. They still had orphanages, and they called them that in uh, Catholic orphanages in upstate New York. And uh, after about two years, because I had not been adopted, my father remarried and collected his children from the various places they were set. And my stepmother and my father uh, had three more children together, and I was a group of seven. This is uh, a group of four of us, the older four, sitting at my father's newspaper office, the Albany Times Union. He wrote a humorous column and was a, um, a journalist as well, a reporter. I'm the uh, one second from the back, the one with the fat knees and the uh, checked jumpsuit. Uh, I'm kneeling up at my typewriter. My father very kindly 
took us out from our stepmother to babysit us for once a year. And we went to the newspaper office and played on the typewriters, mm -hmm. probably on a Saturday. Now, my parents were, very, were, were not very prosperous, and they were very strict. Because of the death of my mother in childbirth, uh, my parents raised us under a lightning and thundercloud of anxiety about who would be the next to go. Uh, so we did not enjoy a lot of middle class privileges that probably we could have afforded. My parents weren't impressed with middle class culture and the, the burgeoning TV generation. So every week at Sunday dinner, the seven children and the two adults had to vote which half hour in the upcoming week the TV would be on for the kids. One half hour a week. Every week it was Gilligan's Island. And this, you know, says a lot about the limitations of democracy, but, you know, the greatest good for the greatest number, or the greatest bad for the greatest number, perhaps. Uh, nonetheless, once a year my parents relented and let us watch The Wizard of Oz when it was shown as a, a kind of moment in the, in the liturgical calendar. I mean, there was Christmas, there was Easter, there was the Wizard of Oz. And because they relented their harshness about too much exposure to TV, it became a kind of magical event. We anticipated it, we talked about it in the weeks to come, all the school kids watched it, and then when we came together ar around the, the, the water cooler, as it were, the water fountain in, in a grade school, we talked about it after it was over and talked about which were our best parts. I suppose in some ways, I began to become a writer when I was about six by dint of loving that extravagant story which was so filled with adventure and privilege and rambling in a way that my life was not. My life was only filled with brothers and sisters and books. Here's a picture of me and my sister and my younger brother. I'm the shy one picking my fingernails. And we're about to start playing The Wizard of Oz again in the backyard. I was a kind of impresario. I would rake in various kids and say, you can be Dorothy, and you be the Tin Man, and you be the Wicked Witch, and I'll be the wizard. And we could, interestingly, we could, we all knew the story very well. If you didn't put the music in it, you could run through the entire 90-minute film in about 12 minutes. Uh, but then, what to do next? I was the boss kid. There's always a boss kid in any group, and I was the boss kid. So I'd say, now we're going to do it again, but this time you can be the Tin Man, and you can be the wizard, and you can be Tinkerbell, and you can be Captain Hook. And somebody would say, oh, Captain Hook doesn't belong in that story. And I would say, hey, it's our story. We can put in it what we want. So in this version, Captain Hook comes to Oz, and he meets the Wicked Witch of the West, and they get married, and they have twins, and they call them Little Hookums and Little Snookums. And so you give, you give kids new material and say, now let's go. It was a, it was a little improv. It was, it was Chicago, you know. <laughs> and uh, the kids ran with it, and I ran with it. And I think it's when I began to understand we all own this stuff together. And there's no way to do damage to the original just by examining it and seeing what else will happen. Here's my brothers and sisters, not even all of us. Uh, when I'm a little bit older, I'm the one at the end with a head like a bowling ball um, and eyeglasses. And I started writing stories that I was playing when I was about in third grade or fourth grade. I showed this slide just to kind of suggest I was never the brightest banana in the bunch, even in my family. I couldn't spell my own last name until I was about in seventh grade. Uh, because of, the, because of the intense pressure and oppression of my parents on our liberty, uh, stories were an escape for me, and I suppose they were mental health and therapy, although I didn't know it at the time. When I say the pressure, here's what I mean. Here's an example. We were not allowed as children to ride two-wheeled bicycles until we were 16 and had passed the New York State driver's license exam and were legally allowed to drive a motor vehicle on the street. That was our, our privilege to ride a bike. That's how strict they were. But they did not restrict our imaginations, and they did not censor our choices in the library. So I was raised by my father, my stepmother, and the local librarians and the local nuns. Here's a story, the oldest one I have, though it's not the first story I ever wrote, called The Hotel Bomb. I know this is not a good slide, and I apologize. The Hotel Bomb at the top, it says, by Gregory Maguire and David Carden. 
The David Carden part is crossed off in pencil, and underneath that it says, stupid David Carden. <laughs> he was my best friend in fourth grade. He was going to help me collaborate on this book, but he never actually did any work on it, so I took his, book off the, I took his name off the credits. Uh, to get a story started when I was in fourth grade, I knew the importance of uh, a hook, an exciting image. Here's a picture of the, the main character, a husband named Bob, who has red trousers and a gray suit coat. He's trying to run 100 miles uh, across the landscape of Ohio to try to save his wife is from who's about to be blown up by a bomb. And I drew the picture first as a way to instill excitement and interest myself in figuring out why is this happening and, and, and what's going on. I also was like any kid, uh, one who found handwriting difficult and tiring. So I would draw pictures in the corner of the pages, every page. I illustrated every page of my first 50 books, let's say, uh, both to take up space and to make the book go faster. But also I realized I was inventing for myself that, uh, that, uh, that theory of left brain, right brain, that sometimes I would draw pictures and then I would look at them and I would see what my subconscious actually was interested in. So here was the picture from chapter one, Bob getting a letter that says his wife is about to be blown up by a bomb. I drew a picture of Bob's wife hanging there on the wall so as to instill sympathy and compassion in the part of the readers. Once when I showed this slide to some second grade boys in um, Syracuse, New York, one kid raised his hand and said, is that a picture of Bob's wife hanging from the wall behind them? I said, yes, it is. And he said, if that was my wife, I'd let her get blown up by a bomb. <laughs> um, you know, which is, you know, I felt I had failed as an artist uh, <laughs> if he didn't have great sympathy. So the stories were always four chapters long when I was in fourth grade, which meant that there was a page for the front and page for the back. Here was the chapter when Bob gets to the hotel. His wife is staying on the 50th floor. The story takes place in 1865, so they haven't invented elevators yet. But he has no, no major cardiac problems, and he's running up. He's at the 19th floor, 31 floors to go. He gets there right in time, throws the bomb out the window. His wife is saved. I did not know how to edit my work. As soon as I was finished with it, I showed it to my brother, my sister, my best friend, and opened up the next set of pages and stapled them with a, with a tot stapler and began the next story. I never knew how to look back and say, why did somebody want to blow Jane up? And who was the villain anyway? And if they did want to blow Jane up, why did they bother to send Bob a letter saying they were, just, they were going to do it? That just gave him a chance to save her. There were many, many loose strands, but what there wasn't was a lack of energy and a lack of motion and a lack of forward thrusting. Now, uh, I don't have pages and pages and pages of my text. I do have pages of illustrations because they're more fun to look at. So to indicate the kinds of things that I wrote when I was a kid, not a single one of these being a homework assignment, I might point out. Um, I guess I was an example of what uh, Malcolm Gladwell talks about in Outsiders, that young person who does 10,000 hours worth of work before they finish college on the thing that they love. And I probably, I counted it up once, I probably did about 10,000 hours of writing between fourth grade and 12th grade just because I love to do it and, and because I was inspired, I guess. Not inspired by anything important, just inspired to work. Uh, all kinds of adventures happened in my early childhood stories, like ladies falling off clipper ships and almost drowning. I see from the, the prose that the, the sailors are willing, but sailors are always willing, so there they go, trying to save her. Avalanches would come down and crash up people's houses. I feel sorry for that particular character. She's running for safety from an avalanche into a, a thatched roofed cottage, which <laughs> uh, I hope it's reinforced with iron beams. Avalanches would come down and knock people off cliffs. I liked perspective. I liked action. I liked to put people in danger, but I always made sure they got saved in the nick of time. People would get notes in the mail that said, beware, um, which is not terribly efficient. Beware of what? You know, beware of the, the left elevator in the bank of three. You know, beware of you know, the lack of proper signage on the streets around East Cambridge. What are you, what are you supposed to be aware of? To get a story started, I began to understand, and these are all things that I found for myself by experimentation, not by reading how to write stories. I, I, I sort of invented the, the notion of the storyboard, and I invented a collection of characters, colored them, drew them, cut them out, and tried to arrange them on the top of my desk to decide where the conflicts uh, where there were surprising conflicts, where there were uh, obvious conflicts, 
and how to, how to make a story out of the stress among the characters. In this set of uh, characters, as you can see, the, the guy with the torch on the upper left looks as if he doesn't really enjoy the beauties of modern ballet. Um, the guy with the bow and arrows had it, just about had it with cafeteria lunches. There's a nun. There's a lady who looks suspiciously like Barbara Eden in I Dream of Jeannie, even though we never voted for I Dream of Jeannie. And three knights in shining armor and a man on a flying carpet. I also figured out the business about how to use a prompt for myself. Sometimes I would draw an exciting picture and then ask myself the journalist questions about it. Here's a lady falling off the roof of a castle. Well, where is this castle? When does this story take place? Since she's not wearing a long skirt, it must be you know, fairly contemporary. Uh, who are those people? Why is the blonde-haired woman looking in the wrong direction? What is that woman carrying in her pocketbook that's so important? that as she's falling through the air, she keeps a grip on the strap of it. If I can answer any of those questions, even a couple of them, then maybe I have the nugget or the germ or the yeast or the virus for a story. Uh, by the time I was in seventh grade, actually a little bit earlier, I had, I had learned how to make friends who would, whom I could boss around and, and put on my team. And so here's a, an example of a story that I wrote in seventh grade. It was about 120 pages long. And the way we would work it would be we'd uh, hit, knock it back and forth like playing tennis or badminton or, or ping pong. I would write three or four pages, bring it into school the next day, hand the, the volume of pages to my friend who would take it home, add a couple of pages of his own, and bring it back. We never talked in advance about what would happen. We just reacted, again, like improv, to whatever had been put on the pages before. Here's a sample chapter, chapter 28, Philip in Trouble. I'm not going to read the deathless prose, but you can see by looking at the picture that Philip is in trouble. He's hanging off the wing of an airplane with one hand, and his girlfriend is hanging off him. Uh, airplane crashes on the next page and burns up. Luckily, Philip and his girlfriend have unusually resilient ankles, and a, a hay wagon has been driving by the airstrip, and they manage to to swing and sway and, and drop themselves into the hay wagon. The only other person in the airplane was the pilot, who was capably doing a backflip out the broken cockpit window and just escaping the flames. Uh, again, lo a lot of danger. Danger was on the edge of my life. It's on the edge of all of our lives. But I was trying to manage danger and write stories about people escaping from the things that might otherwise have happened to them. Upstate New York, Albany, New York, was not a place that inspired a great deal of fascination for me at the time. William Kennedy had not started to write about it yet. So when I was a kid, uh, never going farther afield than, say, the Adirondacks or the Catskills, I said a lot of stories in Europe, which seemed much more dramatic and, and a place where real adventure would happen. Episode in Rome was a story about a lady whose main job is to fix the TV antenna for the Pope. There she is running across the roof of the Vatican. A very important secret signal is coming, going to come into the Pope through the aegis of some talk show, and he has to watch it, but, but the signal's bad, so there she goes. I don't remember too much more about it. Grecian nightmare took place in Greece. You see, I, I began to be increasingly uh, historical, or interested in historiography, let's say, and I wrote down the beginnings and endings of, of the story. I don't remember what was the nightmare about this in this story, except it took place in Greece, and the lady looks like she has a collapsed cake on her head. Something is rotten took place in Denmark. I was trying to cover the waterfront. You know. Some rise by sin. I was in eighth grade. I was becoming pretentious. That's a, a quote from Shakespeare. Some rise by sin, some by virtue fall. Well, I had to ask myself the question, how does one rise by sin? I was a Catholic schoolboy. I had no idea. How does one fall by virtue? I had just a little bit more idea of that. Here's a sample chapter of what I knew of romance. I love you, John. I love you, Margaret. I love you, John. You already said that, Margaret. So I'm, you know, I'm actually not very interested in romance in eighth grade. I just think this is what I'm supposed to be writing about. But I get bored. One of my rules to myself as a writer my whole life has been, if it's boring to me, it's going to be boring to everybody else. So what happens? The next chapter. John and Margaret get new jobs as trapeze artists in the circus. I look at this picture now many decades later, and I think, Margaret looks like she's about four months pregnant. 
that you know women are working a lot later than they used to, and maybe she has good coverage. What they don't know is that Margaret's former boyfriend works at the circus, and he's on the other end of the of the trapeze act, the high wire act. And just as she goes sailing through the air, he's going to tuck his hands back and accidentally miss her on purpose. So now we know how one falls by virtue. Luckily, there's a safety net, and Margaret is in the practice of packing a pearl-handled derringer in the in the her pantyhose. So she bounces back and takes revenge before the end of the chapter. Some rise by sin, some by virtue fall. You keep working at it, you can, you can work it out. I tried, uh, by the time I was about summer be between eighth grade and ninth grade, or seventh grade and eighth grade, I tried branching out, and I tried to write stories for my younger brothers and sisters who were being able to read uh, fairy tales, like this one about two princesses who look like Nazi stormtroopers in drag. Um, very strong shoulder muscles dragging those capes across the floor, out the stairs, out the door. I was imitating different, different genres, trying to figure out where I felt best at home. There was a great love of John le Carré, you know, the man who came in from the cold, the spy who came in from the cold, and, and that stuff when I was a small town in Germany, when I was in early high school. So I realized that what you always have to do is you have to engage a reader by giving them something that they know, but then you have to trick them and surprise them by turning the tables, much as one does in a joke. So if we think of Russian and Sov uh, Soviet and American spies, in the, uh, or, or German spies even, in um, the 40s or 50s or 60s, we think of middle-aged balding men with trench coats. So I decided to put a, a conversion on it and make it middle-aged balding women in trench coats. So what the, the American spy is a woman named Granny Harquin and the Russian spy is a gangster's girlfriend, a mall, with a pistol. She has a head like a light bulb. I tried writing historical fiction, although I didn't know much about, about history, really. If any of you have ever visited the home of Frederick Church, the painter, in near Hudson, New York, on the Hudson River Valley, you might recognize that staircase as the staircase he designed in his home, Alana. I went there. I loved all the art, and I loved the, the 19th century, mid-19th century woodwork, and the, the Moorish, Byzantine, Gothico design of the building. Uh, being an architect was my second ambition in life. But I, I, I didn't actually have Google yet, so I didn't know how to do research on, for instance, how horses' legs were attached to their bodies. Uh, this, leg, this horse could never run because his, his back legs are on backwards. Um, he uh, basically has four front legs. They're all bending in the same direction. Um, and I tried to smear it all up in the rainstorm so nobody would see that I actually didn't know anything about the anatomy of a horse. My characters eventually uh, began to have more complicated adult lives. In this uh, story, whatever it was, I don't even remember, there are two characters um, who have roles in, in Broadway musicals. Who knew? Uh, but still on their nights and weekends off, they have time to do exciting things like fall off fire escapes. Um, the woman on the, on the upper balcony looks like she's balancing a bowling ball on her head, but that was just a blob. I was trying to learn how to do pen and ink, and it was hard to um, control the, the quill pen. Um, this woman has lost her shoe. She's about to lose her mind, but she's lost her shoe. I love how that shoe is highlighted with no, um, with no paint around it. It, it. It's sort of, it's so tender. And I don't, I don't know, really know if she's going to be saved, but I suspect she will. Now, that business about looking at something you love and drawing inspiration from it, when I was about in sixth grade, I discovered the Narnia Chronicles. They weren't as popular as they later became, and it really was a discovery in the library. It was like a scene from a, from a story. Uh, there they were. I, I picked out The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. There was a picture of a dwarf drinking a cup of hot chocolate on the cover, and I thought, this is not just a fairy tale. This is a whole book that has characters from fairy tales in it. How cool is that? I never heard of such a thing, although I had loved the Grimm Tales and the Perot Tales. So quite quickly, I made up my own magic land. I didn't put, set a story in Narnia, but I made up my own land called fly -in, which was, you know, your standard issue, sort of medieval, late medieval magic kingdom with kings and queens and dragons and witches and elves and dwarves and things like that. This kingdom was ruled by a rather loudmouth queen named Ethel Berman, who used to stride around the palace singing at the top of her lungs. She was so loud that they had to hire a sorcerer to get a spell on her to, to shut up once in a while so they could all get some sleep. That was one of the plot points. I suppose you can see the conversion 
of my interest in fantasy and children's stories and my destination on the Broadway musical stage uh, coming together a little bit, even before I was halfway through high school. Um, this is the, uh, uh, the last, in a sense, the last childhood story that I wrote, um, The Nash Manhattan. I think this was in 10th grade. It's about a 50-story hotel in New York, once again. It's the first story in which I put kids as characters. Kids are descending off the roof of a hotel on sheets, the bed sheets they've tied together into a rope. They're trying to steal back a teddy bear that's been stolen from them. The nightclub singer on the, in the, uh, the Windows on the World restaurant, as it were, uh, is having a glass of Alka-Seltzer. She thinks she's going insane seeing two kids on the outside of a skyscraper. Um, the last scene in this story is where the two burglars who stole the teddy bear are being chased and captured by the annual convention of nuns who are having their, their meeting in the, in the ballroom. They tie them up with rosary beads. <laughs> um, yes, I did go to Catholic school through 12th grade. Now, there is a, there is a very thin line between being a Wunderkind and being insane. And we never of us know which side we are at any point or moment of our day. Um, I do address often the importance of keeping notes and keeping a journal, and I've been keeping a journal for, I think, 49 years now, or 47. But there are times when you can go overboard. My sister Annie gave me a little 19-cent duotang folder for Christmas one year. That was our sort of holiday budget, you know, no more than 20 cents, kids. Uh, I didn't know what to do with it, so I put it in some school paper, and I began to keep a list of everything that I ate for dinner in the year 1969. And I have it, uh, and I still have it. And why I did this, I don't know, but once I started, I couldn't stop. I only did it for one year, though. Uh, I began to see how playing with conventions can be funny as well as just a way to learn. My mother, my stepmother, went back to college after her youngest child was in kindergarten and started out by taking computer programming and then computer law, and then for a break she took a course in old films. So one year for Christmas I made her my approximation of an old movie. We didn't have video H recorders or whatever, the Super 8 they called them, uh, again, because we, we, we weren't very prosperous. But there was a local Woolworths with one of those booths where you could take strips of four pictures for 25 cents. So I wrote a play and I got my brothers and sisters and friends and we trooped to Woolworths with our props and our costumes and our set design and we filmed the movie in the Woolworths booth. Uh, passion, pride, and a place to pray. Here's one reel, reel two. My sister Annie, who's about eight, is playing the part of the widow lady whose house is about to be foreclosed on her. Uh, her best line, indeed the best line in the entire piece, is when she says to the villain, you can take my baby, but not me, and she throws her baby in the face of the villain. That's the, the third strip. She's saying it somewhat hilariously because, of course, you know, the camera's going every seven seconds and you, you have to, uh, and then she had to scoot out so that the villain could have his leering close-up. Uh, the baby went out the curtain and over the heads of four cashiers at Woolworths said we were never allowed back there again. Um, so, so there was no sequel. There was no passion, pride, and a place to pray, part two. This is my first published book. I got the idea when I was in high school uh, it was, you know, what was that that movie? I don't know if it was called Multiplicity, but about a person who splits and, and becomes different uh, flitches of his own self. Um, I had that idea, too, before the movie. And so this was a story that I thought of in high school and I wrote when I was in college about a girl, about a boy who meets a girl who is about his age, but there's also a woman in her late 80s, and he's actually meeting the same person at two different points in their, in their time in the same building. Uh, originally it was called Grandma Passes, but I was afraid that sounded too much like Grandma Passes Out. So I changed it to Daniel in Battle and then wrote it three times. I wrote it in, the, in 72, started it in 72, started it in 73, and then started it again for good in 74. I got a, um, you know, three independent study credits for it in my undergraduate degree. Uh, I was good at doing that kind of thing. But it was my first published book. It was published by Farrar Strauss. I sold it as 24, and it was published when I was 25, uh, the first one of, of 38 books to date. I kept drawing all the way through college. I didn't, I didn't do my own covers. My editors never liked the way that I drew. I didn't like this, this cover. This was supposed to be a, a kind of fantastical book, and that, that kid is having a dream journey. But to me, he looks like 
a Campbell's Soup kid who's escaped from jail. Uh, and I don't think any self-respecting kid would want to read that book. And, I, the, you know, the, the, the magic bird looks like a, a rat with polio or something. It's um, a goiter condition of some sort. It's terrible. It's, you know, get out of there. But I kept drawing, and I kept being interested in magic. But I also kept being interested in the way that stories about magic served so adequately, and, and even more than adequately, as situations in which we could talk about everything that's important to us, um, whether it be ethical conundrums, as I tried to talk about in Wicked, or in the new book, Egg and Spoon, about issues really, even though it's set in 1907 Russia, issues about global warming, about food shortages, and about ways of sharing. This is a picture of Baba Yaga the Witch. I did this picture about 30 years ago, I think, uh, with the hope that it would be the cover for my book called The Dream Stealer. Um, I think that would have made a better cover, but indeed, this is the cover they chose. Uh, this was published 31 years ago, and this year, my new book, Egg and Spoon, is about, in some ways, the same character, Baba Yaga the Witch, who stands in two houses on chicken legs. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from this book now, and I'm going to look at my watch, see where we are. I'll just read a little bit, and then I'll flash to the end, and we'll have, you know, five or, or eight minutes for questions. Does that sound good? The girl, Cat, is about 12, and she's a wealthy girl. She has accidentally changed places with a surf girl, a peasant. So the peasant girl is on the train on the way to a party for the czar, where Cat is supposed to be, and Cat, wandering through the woods, has come upon the witch, Baba Yaga, which I drew there. Only she's more like Phyllis Diller, the way I write about her here. The disappearance of stock items from the witch's larder was becoming habitual. Are you running some sort of a cooking consortium behind my back when I'm asleep? The witch demanded of Cat. Cat, I don't cook. That's a job for cook. Cook and butler, butler and cook. I suppose you had someone to soap you in the tub too, lest your hands come in contact with your own personal grease. Don't be disgusting. Don't dare me. I majored in disgusting at Gulag Community College. Lucrecia Borgia taught cooking, and Madame Tufarge taught knitting. Emperor Nero taught violin and also led the cheerleading squad. I skipped all my classes and failed with distinction. I never know what you're talking about. I hear the words, but you quote only nonsense. She's mad, said the kitten. Haven't you noticed? I'm not mad, said the witch, rooting through a cabinet. I'm a scab loose in the head, true, but redeemed by the genius of my personal glamour. If you must know, I'm hungry, that's what I am. She tossed out dusty hardtack, sacks of dried herbs, and an empty mousetrap. Not much of a hunter-gatherer, am I? Improvise, said the kitten. Do I have to suggest everything? Are you volunteering? Kitty kebabs on a charcoal grill? The witch opened a hinged panel in the wall and pulled out a stone fire pit, above which hung a battered copper basin. I never saw that before, said the girl, while the kitten leapt to the rafters. This house, Dum Doma, is always into self-improvement. Every time I turn around, another airing cupboard, a root cellar. Once I opened a door, and there was a closet of the sort that the Americans call an elevator. If I'm not mistaken, it was invented by a man named Otis Elevator. Have you ever seen one? The English call it a lift, and the French la censure. I think the Dutch don't believe in it. The Dutch are a low-lying people. The whole chamber rises to another floor. I took it up and found a penthouse done over in pickled birchwood with a tiger skin thrown over the baby grand. Not to my taste, and maybe dumb Doma caught on, as I've never seen it again. She threw a pinch of cayenne pepper onto the stones, and a roaring fire resulted at once. The house filled with smoke. Dumb Doma opened its windows and flapped to clear off the stench. I just remembered, said the witch, and drew a salted codfish from a purse beneath her clothes. I was using this as a kind of personal sachet, but the time has come to sacrifice my vanity for the sake of dinner. dinner. She threw the fish in the pot, and it began to flop around as if it had been hooked, as if it had just been hooked. In a minute, it was charbroiled. The meal seemed mouth-watering to the girl. I must truly be hungry, she thought. The witch flipped the fish on a plate, picked up a fork, stabbed it, 
and swallowed the entire thing whole. Hey, what about sharing, said the kitten. I forgot. I didn't think you'd want any. I can bring it back up. No, thank you. Is there truly nothing else? Well, I sent you out to scare up a delivery of fresh mi meat, said the witch to the kitten. Instead, you brought in a debutante armed with an ugly party gift for the hostess. Vexing, but there we are. Aren't there some onions in a basket somewhere, asked the kitten. Of course not, said Baba Yaga. No, we have no bread, we have no meat, we have no cheese, no milk. None of my famous Granny Yaga's frozen tater tots, made from real tots. As the great sage put it, when she got there, the cupboard was bare. And so what was there, they all had to share. Nothing. And that, in a sense, is what Egg and Spoon is about. It looks like a fairy tale. It's illustrated. It's not illustrated. It's, it's designed to appeal to those who like books with a little fantasy in it. But just as Wicked is at its heart, not a book about the Wizard of Oz, but a book about how we contemplate it and how we talk about evil and those we deem evil. So too, Egg and Spoon is only superficial, only superficially a fairy tale. It's really a story about equity and about moral distribution of goods. Who has the egg? Who has the spoon? This is a book without a lesson, without a moral. It's a book with a lot of questions. And that is why I wrote when I was a kid and why I write now, to ask questions. Later on, The Wicked Witch of the West came back to me when I was living in London and was the inspiration, not the inspiration, excuse me. She was the garb in which I dressed my questions about evil that came up to me during the first Gulf World War, during the first Gulf War, at the same time that a, a small boy who wandered away from his mother was taken up by two schoolboys who were playing hooky and by the end of the day, murdered by them. The question is about where evil comes from and who defines it and what we do about it if we recognize it in us. Uh, where the conversion for me from uh, a wannabe writer to a professional writer, halfway through my career, 32 year career, roughly 35 years, it was about 17 years in, I wrote Wicked, and that uh, even before the play got to it, it had sold almost a million copies, and it sort of made me the professional that I've been working on being since I was in sixth grade. So that brings us to just a few minutes for questions. I want to say first, thank you for letting me come and talk to you and, and leave you with the question I, I guess for you, which is when you turn off your light and you, you have three minutes before you fall asleep and your mind hasn't yet settled, what, what do you find that comes back to you from the first 10 years that's something you're still working on? I was working for the first 10 years and in a sense I was working, I've been working ever since on why did my mother die when I was born? What did that do to me? In what way was I culpable? And in what way can I make good? on uh, that accident that characterized my beginning and propelled me, I think, into needing to write in order to stay sane and not to be uh, pressured and, and, and crushed down by a sense of obligation and guilt. So if there are any questions about anything that I've talked about, about books, about the Broadway theater, about fantasy, I'm very happy to entertain any. John Gaffney eventually died of AIDS, I'm sorry to say. But before he did, uh, he left the, the, um, the field of writing and drawing and became a concert pianist. So he was, he was a great, he was a very talented kid. Uh, and he had some bad luck. I'm sorry, he died about 20 years ago. We were, be we were best friends up until his death. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much. And I just had a quick question, and it's interesting maybe for some people in the crowd as well, but both um, as your upbringing and as a parent as well. Right now, we're in an age where kids have access, essentially immediate access to other people's imaginations, you know, t hundreds of thousands of years at the tip of their, uh, their fingers, whether it's on YouTube or TV with a thousand channels. And I'm just wondering what your thought of, you know, how that's gonna play into the imagination and development. I'm, I'm a new father of an 18-month-old and trying to battle with 
you know, she has access to this stuff, um, again, at her fingertip versus having to build our imaginations on our own. So just wondering what your opinion is on, on that. I, I, um, that's a great question, and it's a question that my husband and I uh, toss around virtually every night at dinner and have done so for 15 years. And we have not come up with a, a, a particularly uh, heartening answer. We find that, now all our, our kids are adopted. They're all from poor countries. They're from Cambodia and from Guatemala. Who knows what kind of in vitro nutrition they got in infancy? Who knows what their gene pools have conferred upon them? Certainly not the advantages that even my impoverished family uh, could convert, uh, uh, confer upon me or my husband's family who was less impoverished. Uh, nonetheless, they show almost no signs of any imaginative struggle that we can see. None. They, even when they were little, they, maybe they would run cars along the edge of the, of the carpet and play brum brum noises. That was about it. They didn't play, let's play office. Here's a stapler, here's some scotch tape. Let's, let, you know, let's, let's play house. Let's play, let's play mass. I get to be the priest, everybody else has to be quiet. Um, they, they did and have done none of that. They are not verbally supple, despite the fact that both their parents are loquacious and like talking to them, and all our friends like talking and singing and, and being voluble and garrulous. Uh, and I can't, be, I, I can't be encouraging about it. But I also can't know whether ours is a particular test case where these children are daunted by uh, two parents who won't shut up and who have good educations and are older, older parents that are, and, and have a, a thriving desire to want to share with them. So if anybody else has anything more positive to say about that, I'd love to hear about it because I'm still asking uh, the same question. Um, I will say the final thing, though, and I really do mean that. I would love to hear if anybody has anything to say about that. I will say that with every passing year, I try to restrict the privileges. Just as my parents restricted us for TV, I try to pull back the privileges that we've conferred when I see that they're being dangerous. And I do see that they're being dangerous. So our, I have 17-year-old, 15-year-old, and 14-year-old, and they all turn their computers and phones and iPads in at 9 o'clock unless the oldest one is using it for homework and they're locked in a safe with a key um, to try to protect them because I've seen they're all, all three of them making mistakes. Does anybody have any, any encouragement about that? It could be about your own kids. It could be about some kid you saw in the street once who was, who was drawing something with a piece of chalk. <laughs> um, the sense that my wife and I have gotten and, and we've heard from others is that children need to be bored in order to one, learn how to deal with boredom, and two, to um, work from within themselves rather than from what they can look at that someone else has produced. Uh -huh. My brother, when he, my big brother, when he was little, invented a country. Uh -huh. um, uh, I've run role-playing games um, throughout my life, including one that ran 29 years. Oh my gosh. Um, and, and, you know, entire complex world with many um, overlapping plots and so on. And you don't get that from watching movies. Uh -huh. the reading books helps, I think, more than movies because it's more built within your own mind. And you come to the end of a story and you think, where else could that go? Uh -huh. What would I have liked to have done differently? But... I didn't read much, really. Uh -huh. My my entertainment came much more from within myself, but I but I see plenty of other examples of people who read a lot. So I think literature, especially without pictures, um, helps a lot here. Uh, fantasy, uh, romance, and what I understand is its true meaning: things that could be rather than than you know hugging and kissing right. specifically. Right. Right. Um, that's good. Uh, it leads you into those directions at bedtime of um, what you might want to happen or, or what could happen in an alternate reality. That's great. Well, thank you for that. And I, and I too, endorse that if you, can do, if you can divorce the image. The image is so sexy. Any image is so sexy. If you can divorce the image from the word and let the child come up with, with image first um, or, or you know, to, to, to share by providing the image from the brain. I, I also am a mom um, and have a 10-year-old who, it's so funny, some of the ways that you described your 
coming into loving to write and illustrating, he has a similar approach and illustrating his own stories and um, creating characters. And um, it's interesting, this technology question is so ever present. Um, we wrestle with whether, whether it's better to sit and watch a TV show than play a video game where you're planning and thinking and creating like in Minecraft, for right. example. Or if you were um, using uh, an application on an iPhone to create your own Lego movie, is that somehow better or worse because you have a screen um, than being outside and... Uh, and uh, throwing all the toys all over the yard <laughs> because they're using them in ways they were not intended to be used. <laughs> or, right. you know, I, and I guess um, I just want to push back a little bit on some of this because I don't think it's as simple as we make it. Um, and we have to, um, I guess, when you were talking about your kids and the ways that they play, um, they play in ways that surprise you. I find that my kids play in ways that surprise me and make me mad because I want them to play the way yeah. I think they should play. And I guess my question to everybody would be, are we putting expectations on them that, um, that are not helpful in having them deal with the world they have to deal with? Yes, yes, that's a, that's a great question. And, I've, and, and that, when, I, when a therapist pointed that out to me, that I had been raised in, in the 1960s as if I were a sickly Edwardian child, and that if I was trying to raise my children the same way, I was about 100 years out of date. And it wasn't fair to them. It wasn't, it wasn't correct. It wasn't morally correct. And I, I accepted that, and that's when I started to loosen uh, you know, the, 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 the rules a little bit, but then I had to tighten them up again. I think two things about that. I think one is it's quite possible all our kids are playing in ways that we can't interpret because they're so far ahead of us. And their brains are different than our brains, and their world is different than our brains. But the other thing I think about the Minecraft versus the toys flown all over the yard is that there's something about playing which is by its nature transgressive. You know, you have to break the rules in order to play. That's what you're doing in order to play, I think, is breaking the rules. And so when I see my own 14-year-old spend 14 hours on a Saturday downstairs doing Minecraft, I think, where's the potential transgression there? I mean, it's not as if you're building Spanish bordellos. You can't build a bordello in Minecraft. It doesn't let you do that. You know, mm -hmm. run, a, run a prostitution ring, something. I don't care. Just do, do something that breaks the rules of Minecraft. I'm trying to find the pictures. If I have, yeah, there's my, this, this was a Christmas about uh, five, six years ago. But there they are, living fully in their lives, but I don't know who they are. And I want them to be healthy, I want them to be safe, and I want them to be transgressive. And here's the last paragraph, and here's where I'll close. This is from the book Confessions of an Ugly Stepsister, which is not a fantasy, despite the fact that it's based on Cinderella. It's really an historical novel set in Harlem, the Netherlands, uh, in 1628. And here's one paragraph about why I do what I do, and perhaps why we read, too. The, the narrator is an old woman. <clears throat> Crows and scavengers at the top of the story, finches at the top of the linden tree, God and Satan snarling at each other like dogs, imps and fairy godmothers trying to undo each other's work. You might be born as the donkey jaw Dame Mondeliers, or as dazzling Clara Vandenmeer, young woman with tulips. How we try to pin the world between opposite extremes. And in such a world, as Margaret used to ask, what is the use of beauty? I have lived my life surrounded by painters, and I still do not know the answer. But I suspect, some days, that beauty helps protect the spirit of mankind, swaddle it and succor it so that we might survive. Beauty is no end in itself, but if it makes our lives less miserable so that we might be more kind, well then, let's have beauty painted on our porcelain, hanging on our walls, ringing through our stories. We are a sorry tribe of beasts. We need all the help we can get. 
Thank you.